Ce relație există între spațiile contemporane și identitatea subiectului? Ce importanță are experiența migratoare și cum este ea reprezentată? Despre frontierele și locurile identității vom dialoga astăzi cu profesorul Simon Arel de la Universitatea din Montreal. Rămâneți cu noi! Professor Arel, you come from Montreal, where uh, you teach comparative literature in a traditional uh, uh, name of uh, the, the, the field. Uh, you have founded and you are the current director of an important literary lab where the research is done on what you call the mobile self. Mm -hmm. Can you explain us what mobile self means and why that would be a topic of research? Thank you very much, Professor. I've always been interested uh, by the, the metamorphosis of narratives. And uh, one uh, fact that seems very clear to me is that uh, the new narratives of the selves or the selves of the self are becoming more and more uh, mobile. So uh, I just decided to take seriously this reality uh, the mobility of the discourses from the migrant to the refugees, uh, the ordinary citizen who is traveling from town to town or driving from one place to another one, and um, created a, a laboratory on wheels. That is, in fact, a, not a truck, but it is, a, a, well, um, a van that is uh, has been transformed in a studio where is it possible at the same time to teach to my students uh, in different parts of the city where I live on topics that are related to narratives and architecture or urban um, interrogations. So this laboratory is a, is a car, is a van, is a so truck. It is itself mobile. And uh, I just travel with my students and we go from, uh, let's say, for instance, I had a seminar last year on uh, Leonard Cohen, uh, uh, poetry, novels and uh, records, CDs, and uh, I travel in different uh, places in Montreal near the Portuguese park where Cohen has a, from a long time now a house and the old port where the, the very beautiful song Suzanne has been recorded, not recorded but the motive takes place in the, the old port of Montreal so it's, I'm always on the move mm -hmm. and <laughs> that's uh, and what I'm doing. The research is done on narratives uh, in literature but also in popular culture mm -hmm. in other areas of interest. Well, it's, it's the reason why I refer to narratives, because uh, traditionally literature has been confined to the bounds of the, the, the written um, continent. Um, and uh, what I'm uh, doing right now is studying different form of narratives that take place as oral literature, uh, oral poetry, uh, performances and public spaces, uh, spoken word and, and so on, different uh, manifestation of modern poetry. And uh, at the same time I'm uh, involved in uh, many uh, endeavors where uh, the, the main focus is to be able to try, I say try, to get people uh, who are not familiar with uh, this discourse that is kind of compact narratives and so on. Those people who are not part of the university coming from neighbors that are close to the university, underprivileged neighbors, to be able to tell their story. So I'm becoming, a, we say in French, an écrivain public. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm becoming a public writer able to permit or to give the possibility 
for a, a prise de parole, for a, an empowerment. people to have a voice. Oh, yes, an empowerment through narratives. So you are also interested in urban space because the contemporary self leaves and has or has not a place in our urban la landscape. Mm. Uh, how do you relate uh, geography, architecture to theory, for example? Well, I, I always work, but it's, that's the way I am I, 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 and the way it is, but I always worked uh, from, well, the beginning. Uh, in an uh, interdisciplinary uh, perspective fashion. And to me, there is a very important relation between architecture, urbanism, and narratives. Uh, Michel Le Certeau, one of my uh, masters, the French uh, historian, the, the French historian, but who was also very close to psychoanalysis, who, who was a teacher, a professor in San Diego, uh, close to South America, uh, referred to. Uh, récit d'espace, uh, you know, the fact that every narrative is uh, um, constrained by a, a spa spatial um, uh, predicament. So, uh, to me, it's quite important to try to find out about uh, narratives, the locus, the topic, and the, the, the way those narratives take place in a very concrete space. Mm -hmm. uh, you have started such a research at the end of the 80s, mm. uh, last century, and you have Im followed that line, that road, if you want, since then. How do you uh, view the last decades from this point of view of migrations, of r movements? Well, of course, we're living in a troubled world uh, right now for a long period of time. Uh, as you well know, the so-called refugee crisis is uh, uh, that is not only huge that, that that's reshaping our entire world. And what strikes me, because in the Canadian context and the Quebecois context, that is probably uh, less known for your uh, listeners, but uh, multiculturalism I I is. Is a, is a state policy. So migration is uh, part of the social discourse in the Canadian context and look at it as a, well, I would not say positive aspect, but it's a, it's a, it's a fact of life, uh, of course. And uh, well, w one cannot be, uh, mm, uh, should I say that uh, uh, we should be all not only troubled, but uh, we should be at the same time um, not horrified, but a uh, state of uh, helplessness to see people, refugees for instance, that we cannot or do not want to see because we live in a state of denial. And uh, to me, it's very troubling. We live in a world in, in which uh, often in Europe, but in Northern America too, as far as I know, politicians tell us that we need more walls. We should build walls. We mm. should keep people outside. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you view that? Well, it's, uh, I, I, w I, w I would say that it's ridiculous, but to say that it's ridiculous would be uh, pretentious because it would just be the discourse of an intellectual state that, well, that's, well, no, that, that's not relevant. The fact, has, the fact is that people are anxious. They are very anxious regarding their way of life, their identity. Well, what's happening in with the European Union is, is, a, is a, a case that will be studied in uh, universities in 20 years as a major not breakthrough, but breaking of the of, the, of this union. But at the same time, people just go back to what they feel the roots are. And nationalism in this context is always a kind of salvation that does not last. But uh, walls are not the solution uh, because the problem is the problem. There's no problem, but the reality is global. 
So mm -hmm. you, you may decide to have borders uh, as, for instance, uh, our neighbor in the United States, uh, Donald Trump proposed with Mexico. But uh, it's very easy to dig a hole on the ground and just get on you know, the other side of the fence or the wall. So we should look at those realities in a global perspective or post-global perspective that is planetary, that is uh, um, related to, to the way we inhabit the planet. It sounds, well, probably very utopic, but that's the only way on the long term to face those difficulties that are political. Do you think uh, we have uh, correct representations of the refugees in our contemporary uh, world, mass media or art or mm -hmm. literature? Do you know about such things? Well, in, in the social discourse, in journalism, in, in media, as on TV, uh, well, I shall say that uh, there is no representation at all. Mm -hmm. uh, everything is about cliches and stereotypes. So uh, th th this is a representation that is uh, uh, frightening. I mean, the, the, the way we represent the refugee is frightening because uh, this is the figure of the stranger that is part of, well, uh, the way the societies um, represent the otherness. Uh, but uh, I, I come back to uh, the, the state of denial that I, I refer to, and there is no representation because, in fact, refugees, as we look at them, are not humans. They are subhumans, or they are becoming things. Uh, they are becoming the fences that uh, define the borderland. They are becoming the boats that sink. They are becoming, uh, uh, you know, the 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 the, 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 the clothes on, on the beach. They are they are simply not human, and this uh, way of thinking is, is perverse uh, because it is uh, a form of uh, cruel. Well, Freud uh, wrote a, a famous book on the. Malaise dans la civilisation, uh, on the relation between uh, the dead instinct and uh, the, the, the way society are constrived by entropy. And this is the same thing that we are seeing. Societies that are just kind of coming back to an inner core that is the identity of a so-called nationalism and refugees who are external to this reality of humanity that are just things. And uh, well, if we look at the past, that's uh, very dangerous. Uh, what would be, uh, from your experience, a correct representation uh, of refugees? Could we learn from literature such uh, representations or from popular culture? Yes. Uh, I, uh, in, in, my, in my own cultural uh, world and background, we have a long tradition of fiction um, in the, the, the Quebec context, for instance, but that is French speaking mostly, but also in English Canada, of uh, novels, poetry, theater that uh, are literary expressions and cultural expressions coming from authors that uh, uh, are refugees or immigrants or whose parents, uh, grandparents had been refugees or immigrants. So that's part of our curriculum in school. So uh, you have writers as Dany Laferriere, for instance, who is an Haitian born writer who has been elected to l'Académie Française last year, uh, who, who, live, uh, who lives in Quebec now for 25 years. We have a, a great uh, Asian diaspora in Quebec, many great writers as uh, the, the late Emile Olivier. You have uh, Pan Bouyoukas from uh, uh, 
uh, whose parents uh, uh, migrated from Greece, and, and many, many, many writers, Wesh Dimouawad, who's actually is living in France, but uh, is coming from Lebanon. And all those uh, writers uh, are part of the teaching curriculum, and they contribute also to reshape the form of the cultural, and I will not say national identity, but the cultural identity. So it gives the possibility, well, fiction uh, gives uh, the possibility to gain from new experiences that are, well, imaginative, that mm -hmm. are emotional. So there is, of course, a catharsis that is involved in all cultural aspects, but there is also uh, the possible to gain from a grounded experience that is fully uh, uh, enunciated in a fictional world, and it's important. Do you think that uh, uh, the case of Quebec could be a model or at least a reference uh, in this way of finding the right representation? Well, uh, Quebec is quite singular. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an almost state. Uh, we have two referendums. Uh, it is a minority in North America. French-speaking minority, uh, but it's a uh, wealthy minor minority, um, and uh, we are well. We are. We are. I don't know what what, what this we are means, means. anyway. Okay, but uh, let's say that the, the population of Quebec is eight million. So you have the First Nation uh, people that were. At, at, the, at the source of what became a colonial project. Uh, we have a generation of migrants from Ireland, uh, from uh, Scotland, uh, uh, and uh, more recently from uh, uh, the Maghreb, and from Lebanon, and from South America. And there is a project that is not defined as multicultural or intercultural, as I said, those policies are state policies, and well, a policy does not solve anything, you know. But the way we live, especially in Montreal, is an attempt to uh, just uh, get through those identity constraints in order to to live together. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the concept of mobile self. Do you think that the self has always been mobile? Or uh, there were periods in the past where the identity was more fixed and mobility came afterwards? It's very difficult to go back to the, to the past, but if we look at uh, you know, invasions in Europe, <laughs> that was mobile, <laughs> but people were just running <laughs> for their life. You know? Uh, but more recently, in the post Second World War era, it's clear that technology enabled us to be more efficient, productive. And uh, I, I, I do not agree with everything, but it's a fact that it's easier to travel when you have some money or to go from one place to another that it was possible at the beginning of the last century. But what interests me is not mobility per se, what interests me is precarious mobilities. So not the mobility done by one's own will, but something that is uh, in a way uh, uh, imposed from outside. The subjects of mobility that is, as you said, imposed from outside, but our people who are underprivileged cope with a mobility that is imposed and how they react, and how they create their own form of mobility as a way of living. I give you a, a very a simple example. Well, I'm not interested in uh, you know uh, 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 travelers uh, um, uh, with an American Express card and taking Tourists. the plane to go to to go to from Frankfurt to. Uh, uh, London, let's say. That's, that's not in, well, a lot of people are working on, on those uh, facts that are related to, to uh, economy and economics, but that's not what interests me. What interests me is uh, the ordinary people who are walking. 
Mm -hmm. uh, what interests me is the street musician. What interests me is uh, the, the young people who are creating new form of theater and public spaces. And uh, what interests me and when uh, the, the policemen are going to this uh, park to shut everything off because it's not legal. You know? mm -hmm. What interests me is precarious form of mobility. And, uh, and I think that's the future. Because mm -hmm. if we just accept mobility as a fact of life, uh, we will be uh, totally, uh, uh, well, not destroyed, but uh, we will be, we'll, we'll become stereotypes. Uh, the, the traditional view, the conservative view, would say that this uh, precarious mobility should be limited. You think that it cannot be limited and it will affect the system, the urban landscape, the culture? Well, I think that, uh, um, well, w we say that we are postmodern, and we say now for intellectual that we are post-postmodern or whatever we call it. But I, I, I think that we are, uh, we are defined, whatever we like, like it or not, by modernism, and that our reflection on mobility is um, unifying uh, and uh, the way we perceive mobility as a grand scheme is, well, unifying and uh, abstract. In fact, precarious mobility is just the way things are. Like uh, my, my dear colleague Loraelia mentioned uh, sometimes, uh, we are tricksters. Tricksters is an important figure in the First Nation mythology. That, that's an animal. Uh, a trickster is an animal that we don't see most of the time. It's very, very peculiar. And the trickster in some First Nation mythologies are animals who are at the same time humans who are able to go through uh, a very delimited spaces or cultural or social environment and to poach through those walls and to subvert in fact those walls. So precarious mobility is not is not tragic. It's just that in the real way we live uh, we do not go from point A to point B. So there is always a zigzag, there is always a, a way of turning around, and that's my definition of life. Professor Arel, thank you very much for this interview, and I think we should end with this idea of a zigzagging travel through the world and the future. Thank you. Subiectul contemporan, spune Simon Arel, locuiește pe o frontieră invizibilă. Geografia sa este incertă, iar identitatea sa este pradă stereotipului. Sunt toate semne că lumea se schimbă, iar arta este provocată să depună mărturie despre aceste transformări. La revedere!